Okay, so we last week we left off with LPS, its structure and its uh, biosynthetic pathway. And then I left you with a question in the evening, microbe of the week one, which was the following. Mycobacterium tuberculosis is resistant. It's got peptidoglycan in its cell wall, but it's resistant to penicillin, cephalosporins and vancomycin. Why is that? Why is it so resistant? Now, what you have to do in these questions is not tell me what you think the answer is, okay? Because there's a real answer out there, not a matter of opinion. And uh, so you have to try and find out what that answer is and then write back and tell me. It's always going to have something to do with uh, what we've what's been presented in that day's lecture. So what you should be thinking of doing is just go uh, and have a bit of an internet search and you can find that. Oh, it's just going to come out. I have to, I have to quit presentation here and then it will allow me to give you um, Ah, okay, it's this way. Right. Okay, just look at Wikipedia, mycobacteria, and it will give you some hints. And the answer is, so you get to see, this is the structure of the mycobacterial cell wall up here. Okay, so you've got plasma membrane, peptidoglycan layer, and then you have this outer structure, which is specific to mycobacteria. It's an outer membrane, but it's very different from what you find in gram negatives. And the big difference is this uh, purple stuff here, too. That's mycolic acid. Okay, so it's fixed directly onto the outer part of the peptidoglycan through this like polysaccharide here, the arabinogalactan. And then look at the size of this carbon tail here, this aliphatic part. It's really, really long. Okay, so this is going to give you a hydrophobic bilayer, but it's not going to be fluid like a normal lipid bilayer. This is very waxy, and it means that. Uh, Basically, it's much less permeable even to organic or, or hydrophobic compounds. And secondly, also means that the porins which exist in mycobacteria are going to be very, very different from the porins that you find in gram negatives. So they don't have the same permeability properties. So that's why, in fact, mycobacterial porins don't let penicillins, cephalosporins diffuse through the outer mycolic acid layer my, of, the, of the cell wall. Okay, so that's, that's the right answer, okay? The cell wall structure is different and it's much less permeable to antibiotics. So that's why mycobacteria, mycobacterium tuberculosis, M. leprae, are much more uh, resistant to most antibiotics. So that was the answer and I got a lot of responses, so thanks very much, everybody who took part. It's always good to get a higher uh, turnout. Now, Mr. Alexander here, he got the first answer, but a little bit short, okay? So he didn't get the full three points. There was a bonus point here for telling me that isoniazid is a, an antibiotic that works on mycobacteria by inhibiting uh, mycolic acid synthesis. Everyone else? Okay, either correct or not correct. Right, so we get back to what we're supposed to be doing today. Okay. And we left off with LPS, the uh, last kind of, well, the next structure on the outside of the bacterial cell we need to understand is the <laughs> capsule. Capsule antigens, these can be found in gram positives and gram negative cells. They're not always present and even within a species, they can be different. So they are useful for identifying bacteria. And in that case, when you're talking about 
serological identification, these capsule antigens are called the K antigen. Okay, LPS, the repeats, the variable repeats, that's the O antigen. Capsule is the K antigen. So they're polymers, mostly it's polysaccharide, most frequent case. Sometimes it can be polypeptide, like in bacillus anthracis, anthrax bacillus. It's got a capsid, it's made out of polypeptide. Now, capsid, no, capsule, capsule. So another word for the capsule, this kind of uh, thing that you can see here is either uh, glycocalyx when it's made exclusively of uh, polysaccharide. And you can see it here, okay? So I'm labeled as gly here for the glycocalyx, just another word for capsule. Now, if the capsule is not firmly attached to the bacterium, it can easily be removed. Often it can be called a slime layer. So these kind of interchangeable terms, capsule, glycocalyx, slime layer, it's the same thing. And you can see the capsule by light microscopy. This is an example here. This is just with kind of negative staining. So these are bacterial cells in India ink. So the background is dark, and whenever you've got a cell, it excludes the dye. So you can see the inside, this is the bacterial cell. And the capsule is this kind of like half stained, half transparent structure. Okay, so that's what it is. What is it for? Well, it's just for protecting the bacterium. Firstly, it can protect the bacteria from some kind of chemicals like detergents, antibiotics and can protect the bacteria from attack by viruses, bacteriophages, that can infect and kill bacterial cells. So the capsule antigen will prevent these guys from sticking to their receptor. Also, in the same kind of, uh, in, in, in the same line of protecting bacteria from other kind of biological threats, it's very important in a number of pathogenic bacteria in order to make it more difficult for phagocytes, macrophages or neutrophils, to engulf bacterial cells and kill them. So the presence of a capsule is an important determinant of virulence and pathogenicity for, for example, Streptococcus pneumoniae. The variants that have got a capsule are more dangerous than the ones that don't. Same is true for Salmonella as well, in fact. And the last thing is, these are quite hydrophilic polymers, and they will retain water. So they allow bacteria to resist from getting dried out if they're on a dry surface. Okay, so that's the role of the capsule, just to protect the bacterial cell. Now, how are they produced? Once again, you, don't need, you won't need this for the exams because we don't show this for the other L2 students, but I think it's interesting to know because it's really quite similar to what we've already seen for the synthesis of peptidoglycan and LPS, at least the O repeats. So it all starts in the cytosol. Okay? You have the synthesis of the repeating subunits of the capsule. Could be a dimeric peptide, could be a you know, tetramer of different sugar molecules, but they're synthesized here. They're attached onto bactoprenol again. Once again, this transporter, the lipid transporter, bactoprenol diphosphate, is flipped over in the membrane, and then the subunit is attached onto the kind of growing polysaccharide chain that's in the periplasm. And then once you've got enough, the whole thing is shifted up to the outer membrane, and it will be covalently attached onto the outer membrane in gram negatives, okay, in gram positives, it's going to be attached to the outside of the peptidoglycan layer. Okay, so for capsule synthesis, for synthesis of LPS and synthesis of peptidoglycan, this, the bacteria have got the same problem, how to synthesize a complex polymer on the outside of the cell. And they use the same kind of mechanism. And bactoprinol is involved in all three of them.
A couple of more things that you can find on the outer surface of a bacterial cell. Uh, fimbriae or fimbriae and pili. Actually, I never did Latin in school, so don't ask me how to pronounce these things. Now, uh, what I can say is the, the, these structures are small filaments on the outside of the cell. So you can, if you look at this electron micrograph here and this one, you can see here you've got these really big things. These are flagella. And on the outside, you can just about see some kind of like small hairs on the outside of the cell here. The same thing over here, you've got two bacterial cells. You've got a lot of hairs on this one, and then this conjugation pilus that is joining the two bacterial cells. So these were first uh, identified and described by electron microscopy, and two people made the discovery at the same time. So that's why there are two names for pretty much the same structures. So there's one scientist in Dundee, in Scotland, he discovered them, he called them fimbriae. And apparently that's from fimbria, which means like a thread or a fiber. Okay, a fil, that's where the name comes from. And there was another researcher in the United States who saw the same thing, and he called them pili, which is like hair, like poil. That's why we have two names for these things, all right? So uh, I'm going to use them interchangeably, all right? For me, they're the same things, except for whenever you see this thing, okay, the conjugation pilus, that's never going to be called fimbria, a fimbria, this thing. It's a pilus. Conjugation pili are very different. Wow. Okay, so you can have, you know, hundreds of fimbriae, pili, on the outside of a bacterial cell. And you'll only have one, two, or three conjugation pili per cell. Generally, they're going to be much shorter than flagella, but this one's a fair, fair size here, you know. And they're going to have a smaller diameter than flagella, so these are quite narrow. And depending on the type of fimbria or pilus, then you'll have either very, very fine filamentous structures, or for the conjugation pillars, it's a little bit more, a little bit uh, thicker. That's because it's hollow in the inside on the, and something's got to come out through the middle. All right, so what are the, the functions of these different things? Mostly, fimbriae are for adhesion, either onto inert surfaces, so bacteria will try, tend to collect on, I don't know, your shower curtain or the, around the edge of your sink, something like that, and they're holding on by, perhaps by these fimbriae that allow them to adhere. In pathogenic bacteria, the fact that bacteria can stick to certain sites of your body and colonize them is often due to adhesion through fimbriae. Now, some of them, some of these fimbriae, can also secrete things. And they are kind of like syringes that can inject toxic molecules into host cells. So these are secre or secretory fimbriae. We'll see a little bit in more detail how they work in the next slide. And finally, some of them are used in gliding motility. So that is, if you've got a surface like this and a bacterial cell, it can send out fimbriae that will adhere to the surface. Okay. Some of them can be projected quite a long way and they'll adhere. But then what can happen is that the bacterium can retract these fimbriae, and this will produce force. So it allows the bacterium to move along here and slide along the surface that it's attached to. OK, 
and this is only type 4 fimbriae can do this because in order for this to happen the bacterium has got to be able to control how it extends the fimbriae and how it can retract them and that's not possible for all types so it's only type 4 fimbriae are involved in gliding motility Okay, so along with, uh, next to that you have the conjugation PD, F I think is for fertility, fertility factor, and they're involved in attaching to uh, other bacteria and transferring genetic material to them. Okay, so different types of fimbriae and pili, how are they formed? Once again, you've got a complicated structure on the outside of the cell. It's going to be difficult to synthesize something. Now, classically, there were dif the different types of pili. One, two, three, and four were defined by antibodies and serologically. Uh, this kind of classification still works for type three and type four pili. But for type one and two, it's uh, obsolete because, in fact, it got these two different types. The uh, chaperone usher and the curly pili mixed up. So type 1 and type 2 isn't, isn't a valid classification anymore. Okay. Uh, now that we know uh, what they're made of and their biosynthetic pathways, we have this classification. Okay. So you have chaperone usher pili, curly pili, type 3, and type 4. All right, so let's have a look, find out what is happening here. Okay, so the first type. The chaperone usher pili, used by Escherichia coli and a lot of other bacteria, mainly for adhesion. Okay, these two, their main role is adhesion. So for chaperone usher pili, what's going to happen is, okay, the, the structure itself has got an adhesin at the tip, so that's going to bind specifically to something. And then you've got the major fimbrial protein here, which makes up a big long fiber. So, and it's attached to the outer membrane. So all of these structures are for gram negatives. Right? Gram positives can have some fimbriae that are pretty similar to this one. They're like curly pili. But most of these other structures are only in gram negatives. Okay. Right, so going back to the chaperone usher pili, how does the main fiber protein, the major fimbrial protein, assemble. So it's co-translationally exported into the periplasm. And the important thing here is that before these individual monomers can join up together and make a fiber inside the periplasm, which would be useless, okay, it gets bound by a chaperone in the periplasm. And the chaperone will take it over to this basal structure here, which is the usher. And the usher is going to help take the uh, fimbrial protein and put it onto the base of this fiber. So subunits are added on from the base here. Okay. And it's already in the outer membrane. So once it, once they've been you know, shoved out there, they can't the, the cell can't really do anything to control what happens afterwards. They just synthesize and they can't be retracted. You have something a little bit similar with the curly pili. Okay. So they are um, once again, secreted into the periplasm, and then they get uh, they get uh, bound by this transporter, which is going to push them out to the outside of the cell. And once they're out there, they're going to bind to the top of the fimbria. So it just builds up a pile of these subunits, and that makes a fiber. Once again, you know, once it's made, it can't really be retracted. The next one, if we go on to the type 3 pili, this is very, very different. So there's a big basal structure that spans the, in the plasma membrane and the outer cell membrane. Now, as the main, uh, so this is the, the filament here, this is the filament structure. So this filament structure is produced by subunits, and they're transported up the inside of this structure. They go all the way up the inside, and they come down, and they bind at the top. 
And this type, type three, they take as cargo, not just the subunits of, the, uh, of the, uh, this kind of needle structure here, but they can also be used to export other proteins and inject them into a eukaryotic cell. So Salmonella, typhimurium, it's a pathogen. It can inject toxins into cells through these type three secretion pillies. Okay, something slightly similar is the type four secretion pillies. And once again, the main filament proteins they form up a tube, and through this tube, you can have injection or secretion of uh, proteins or plasmid or DNA. So agrobacterium tumefaciens, it will subvert the plant host cell's biology by injecting a plasmid into the plant host. And that is injected through this type four secretion. Now, the big difference here is that it seems like the, the, the subunit that makes up this uh, filamentous structure is not really added at the top here. It seems to be added at the base. And why do I say that? Because it's by analogy from type 4 pili, which are used for gliding motility. You know, it's this one. And so what happens here is that the major filament protein is added at the plasma membrane, okay? And so the whole filament is extruded from here, not from up here, okay? So it's extruded from the base. This requires ATP, so the cell's got to put energy in to, you know, uh, to extend this kind of uh, pilus. But it's reversible. So if the filament proteins depolymerize here, they can be taken back into the cell, and the whole filament will retract. Okay. So type 4 pili are the only ones that can do this. And it's because of the way that they're synthesized by the bacterium. It's true for okay, type 4 pili involved in gliding motility. It's true for the type 4 secretion pili. It can be extended and retracted. And it's also true for the F pilus or conjugation pili. So conjugation pili, they are kind of special modification, special, a special uh, variation of type 4 secretion pili, in fact. Actually, kind of about now, I tried to show a couple of videos of conjugation pili in action. But I forgot to uh, look and find out where they were. So I'll, I'll just have a, have a go and see if I can find these and show you what it looks like. Okay, let's show you this, see if it will open up. Whoa. It's kind of small, it's a little bit bigger. Go back here. Wow, stop, 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 stop. stop. Okay, so here in this video, this is fluorescence microscopy. The red things, these are individual bacterial cells. And the conjugation pilus, the F pilus, as it extrudes from the cell, is going to become green. Okay. So this is a cell here. And look, it's starting to put out an F pilus here. Look at the size of that thing. Look. It's about four or five times longer than the cell itself. And there's another one going up there. So you can have more than one being extruded from the same cell. Uh, 
lots of next one. So let's see what it does when it hits another cell. I think this one's a good one. Okay, so there's one cell. It's got an F pilus that's been extruded. And if I remember rightly, uh, maybe not. Okay, it's not doing very much, just kind of waggling around. But in fact, you can see it's getting shorter. Okay, so it can be retracted, this kind of thing. Right, let's try. Okay. How about this one? Yeah, okay, here we go. So one of these is going to latch onto another cell. That's it, it's found it, it's bound this cell, right? So now it's retracting. It's kind of like a fishing line. It's hooked this other bacterial cell and it's reeling it in. Okay? So that's the function of this uh, F pilus, is that you know, it's got to go and bind to another cell and then it's going to be retracted so they're in close uh, contact. And in fact, uh, actually, what I need to do is put this now. So in fact, it's, it's generally thought that during bacterial conjugation, the DNA goes up through the, uh, through the inside of the filament. But it's never really been proven, in fact. Okay? So it may be that um, the uh, conjugation pilus, its role is really to go out, catch the other bacterial cell, bring it really close. And maybe the filament, the DNA, is just going to be injected through the basal part here and not really through the, the filament. Okay. Everybody okay with that? Now, flagella, they're also, of course, you use, uh, involved in bacterial motility, this time through a liquid. And one thing which is uh, essential to know about flagella is knowing what these terms mean, okay? Monotritious, lofotritious, and peritritious. And it's just telling you where the flagella are on the bacterial cell. So monotritious flagella, that means just one. It's a one end of the cell. Lofotritious, several, but they're at one end of the cell. And peritritious, all the way around the cell. That's all you have to know. Now, when you look at the ultrastructure of the flagellum, this is what you see. There's a basal structure here. Once again, we're looking at gram negative, so you've got outer membrane, peptidoglycan, inner membrane. Gram positives can also have flagella. The main filament is up here. So this can be, I don't know, a few hundred nanometers long, maybe a few microns long. Kind of hook structure and then this basal structure here. Now, all of this, all right, it looks very similar to a type 3 secretion pilus. The only thing that's added is this kind of rotor uh, assembly here around the base plate. And this rotor allows protons to be transported from the periplasm to the cytosol. And this provides energy to turn around this axle. So flagella means whip, right? But don't imagine that the flagella on the bacterial cell are going like that. It's just spinning around like a kind of a propeller. Okay, so how are they produced? Well, the main flagella protein, flagellin, it's added to the tip of the flagellum. It's just the same, exactly the same thing as a type 3 secretion pilus. Okay? The main flagella protein is transported up inside the tube and it gets added on at the, outside, at the, at the extremity. And there's a specific flagella tip protein that blocks it off at the end. Okay? So flagella are, are, are never used for uh, 
injecting proteins or exporting proteins because they're, they're, they're blocked off at the extremity. Okay, so that's the only thing I want to know about, I want to say about flagella synthesis because if you know how these ones are synthesized, okay, for flagella, just exactly the same thing. Now, I think with uh, Mr. Sacagnon, you may, uh, yeah, I think you, you go in, he goes into detail about how uh, bacterial chemotaxis is controlled at the molecular level. So right now, I just want to give you a basic idea of how bacteria control uh, flagella rotation to uh, move towards nutrients and move away from I don't know, acid or something like this, too much light, things that can be harmful. So uh, if you were building a drone or something, or a helicopter that's going to fly through three dimensions, you probably want to have something that's going to allow you to go forwards and backwards, something that's going to allow you to go left and right, and something that can allow you to go up and down. So you would need to have three moving parts, okay, for each one for each dimension. And that might be how you design it. But bacteria don't have that luxury, okay? They only have this flagellum. It can only move. It's got two choices, right? It can go in a clockwise direction or counterclockwise. So those are the two choices you've got. And there's no point in having them going like forwards and backwards because you'll never be able to turn. So you can't modify your direction. So bacterial motility by the flagellum has two different modes. One is moving straight ahead, which occurs when the flagella rotor is turning in an anti-clockwise sense. Okay, in that case, the bacterium is going to go in a straight line. And if the flagellum starts to turn in the other way, clockwise, then you'll have the bacterium which will fall all over itself, start to tumble around in a random direction. So that's true either for monotritious bacteria or what is this one? Peritritious, right? It's got the flagella all the way around the cell. So that's true in both cases. Okay, you've got the two different modes of motility, straight line or random. And the way that bacteria can actually get towards something they want, so if you have a lot of glucose around here, The closer you are to the glucose, the higher the concentration is. The further away you are, the lower the concentration is. So you've got a concentration gradient. Okay. You start out with a bacterial cell. It's moving in a straight line. Now, as long as it's going up the concentration gradient, the flagella rotor is going to carry on turning anti-clockwise. It's going to go straight. Oh, just up to here, you're just perfectly happy. You're in bacterial heaven here, okay? Lots of glucose. But, of course, you over, it overshoots. So it starts going down the concentration gradient. So when that happens, so here we're going anti-clockwise, right? This is the flagella rotor. When that happens, you'll have a change. And the bacterial rotor will start turning clockwise. So instead of going, carrying on in a straight line and going further and further away, our bacterial cell is going to start moving in a random direction. Then after a while, it's going to switch. The flagella rotor will switch to moving in an anti-clockwise sense again. And then it's going to go in a straight line. Now if it's moving away from the glucose, it's going to start switching again, start moving randomly. Okay, here we're going clockwise. And then from time to time, just by chance, just randomly, it's going to hit the right direction and start moving up the concentration gradient again. So what happens is just by switching between these two modes, going in a straight line and moving around randomly, you're going to end up staying quite close to the glucose. Okay, so this is how they can navigate in three dimensions uh, in a 
kind of functional way just by having two modes of movement, straight and random. Now, I've always had a dream of being able to like have a kind of a, try and do a, a, a kind of a model of this with students, right? And having like somebody blindfolded and change them to going randomly or moving in a straight line, but I'm afraid we don't have space. So ju you just Maybe you can try it on your own, I don't know. I don't know, try and figure out who is the most attractive person and try and navigate the bacterium towards that person. See how it works out. Okay, so that's about enough for the external structures of bacteria. I'm going to send you out this question. So if you're all connected, you can get up, connect your devices to respond.cc. And we'll do it with the M clickers because I don't know if you noticed last week, but when I sent this question out for the through the high tech way, I got about nine or ten answers. When I asked people to put their hands up, I got six or seven answers. So I think sometimes people don't want to anyone else to know what they think. So if you connect up, go on to Send this question out. And you can tell me what you think the right answer is. See if you've been listening to me. So the code is. Some people it works. Think about it. What do you think? Can be more than one correct answer, could be zero correct answers. I've got about 10 answers here, so let's have a look and see what you've been saying. 
need to get a few more as the connection comes up. So, so these are the answers so far. Okay, so the core antigen, most people said no. Some people said the O repeats, some people said CUPD, some people said peptidoglycan. Everybody said capsule antigen, correct. Okay, K antigen, that's right. That's important for identification. Uh, the other correct answer is this one. The O repeats, the O antigen, the repeated structure. That's correct. This is wrong. The core antigen is constant, is the same in different bacterial species. So it's no good for identification. That's, this one is wrong. And this one, peptidoglycan, that's also wrong because it's very, very similar or identical. The basic structure is the same in all bacteria. So you can't differentiate by looking at differences in the structure. Okay, there's some differences between gram positives, gram negatives, but it's not really very useful okay, for identification. Uh, okay, if you're gonna be picky, you could say, yeah, the peptidoglycan structure is different between gram positives and gram negatives. That, that, that's true, but Okay, so let's accept this one, but it's going to be low resolution in terms of identification. This one is correct. This one's correct. This one's also wrong. All of these fimbriae, pili, they are too variable. Too variable to be useful, in fact, for fimbriae. The exception is the flagella antigen. Okay, flagella are used for, useful for identification. And this is going to be called the H antigen. H because it's inactivated by heat. And that's because the flagella protein, it, the flagella structure is made out of protein, so it's denatured. Whereas LPS, the O repeats, and the capsule antigens are heat resistant. So they're not affected by heat. Okay, so those three things you should also know. K antigen, capsule, O antigen, LPS repeats. H antigen is the flagella protein. Okay, so that, that's it. We've pretty much finished the outside of the bacterial cell. So now we're going to have a look at what's on the inside. Ah, the answer, generally speaking, is not very much, okay? The internal structure of bacteria is not very complicated. But there's a couple of things that you need to know, okay? So the DNA inside the bacterial cell, generally one large circular chromosome, but it's not just sitting around there uh, free in the, inside the cell. That's because if you are, were to lyse a bacterial cell and release the chromosomal DNA, there's far too much of it for it to just to be free in a linear form inside the bacterial cell. So that means that inside the nucleoid, which you can see on this electron micrograph, this is false color. That's a, nu that's a nucleoid, that's DNA here. It's condensed. And it's condensed with polyamines like spermidine, spermine, and some bacterial proteins called the HU proteins. So when double-stranded DNA is condensed with polyamines, the HU protein binds that and it allows these strands of condensed DNA to be curved. So HU proteins and polyamines, they're, for, they're performing the same structure functions rather as, as histones. But structurally, there, there's no relationship. Now, the DNA is generally in direct contact with the cytosol, but there are some weird and interesting exceptions. So there's archaea. Okay, some groups have got histones. And then there's this weird thing here, uh, which is called gemata obscura globa. So this thing has got a membrane that surrounds the DNA. 
Of course, having a membrane-bound nucleus is the main characteristic of eukaryotic cells. And it's really a big surprise to, to, to find that some bacteria have this kind of organization. And this is recent, okay? So it was only published in 2005. Maybe a bit before that because this is already reviewed. So along the theme of uh, things that only eukaryotes are supposed to have, but bacteria have them too, is the bacterial cytoskeleton. And bacteria have some structural, or some proteins that have structural homology to actin and tubulin, okay, which are the main components of the eukaryote cytoskeleton. So MREB, this is the name for this protein in gram negatives in E. coli, and MBL, which is MREB-like protein in bacillus, they are structural homologues of actin. And just like actin, they can form filaments. They can polymerize, they can depolymerize. And this picture shows you uh, a green fluorescent protein uh, combined with MBL so that you can see the structure of these filaments in a live cell. So they form a kind of helical filament. And this is what gives the cell that it's rod shaped, well, it's rod shape. Okay, so all bacilli have one of these proteins. Okay, so if you knock out MREB in E. coli or MBL in bacillus, then the cells are spherical. Okay, and coxi, they don't have these proteins. So this is something, this is the molecular explanation of one of the very basic differences you can see under the microscope, okay? Bacilli have an elongated shape because they expre express these filamentous proteins. So what you can see in gram staining, you can see gram positive, gram negative, that's to do with differences in the cell wall structure, and whether cells are bacilli or coxi, and that's just to do with MREB and MBL. FTSZ, so that's the bacterial equivalent of tubulin. Once again, kind of like tubulin, it can exist as a monomeric form or it can form structures. So in bacteria, the role of FTSZ is to mark out the region of the cell that's going to be divided in two during cell division. So what is happening basically is in cells before DNA replication starts, FTSZ is in a monomeric form. That's these small kind of, oh, I'm looking at my screen, not here. Okay, FTSZ is present in monomeric form. It's these small white round things. And as DNA replication starts and progresses, the two origins of replication are going to migrate to different poles of the cell. This is at the point when FTSZ starts to form a ring structure. So it's going to start to polymerize and form a ring here. And then finally, where FTSZ accumulates, that's where the bacterial cell is going to split in two. Now, apparently, the FTSZ itself doesn't have any contractile function. It's not going to, like, squeeze the cell in the middle or something until it, like, squashes it until it divides in half. But it's just a kind of platform for the, well, the accumulation and the activation of the different proteins that are going to divide these two cells apart, or bring, pull these two cells apart, divide the cells in two. Now, that's very interesting, because if you think about eukaryotic, uh, chromosome segregation, okay, what you have is a very, very different organization of the nucleic acid of the genome. You've got several chromosomes that are linear with the centrosome, this kind of thing. But one of the important events 
is the formation of, let's see if I can draw this and see if anybody can guess what this is supposed to be. This is what? Don't say a duck or something like that. Okay. It's supposed to be a mitotic spindle. Fuso. Spindle, okay. Up, L E. And the beginning of the formation is the, the, the formation of these uh, centrosome structures. They're going to migrate to either side of the, of the, of the cell. The, at the base of this is gamma tubulin which is going to form a ring structure, and that's the base of the formation of the mitotic spindle. So at the very beginning of chromosome segregation in eukaryotes, you've got the formation of a ring by gamma tubulin. Something similar is happening here, okay? So you have a, a protein with a, a very, very, very similar structure, and they have a performing a function that is... Okay, it's not exactly the same. It's not really doing the same thing, but at least you can see and get an idea of how this kind of complex system might, in fact, be derived from something very, very simple that already occurs in bacteria. And to get to this more complicated eukaryotic system, you start out with all what you're already using in bacteria, and then you kind of modify it. Okay, so that's FTS said, what it's for. Actually, that reminds me of something I should have said here is that, okay, although the bacterial chromosome looks like it's just floating around in the middle of the bacterial cell, in fact, at the origin, it's going to be attached to the cell wall or cell envelope. And that's very important because it's attached by what are known as anchoring proteins. So in the bacterial cell, you'll have chromosomal DNA attached at the origin to the cell wall. So once DNA replication starts, you start getting two origin structures. So one of these is bound to the cell wall here, and one of them is going to bind a little bit further along. So as the cell grows, these two origins will move apart. And that's a very, very simple mechanism for chromosome segregation to ensure that you've got one copy of the chromosome goes to this end of the cell and the other copy goes to the other end. And then once DNA replication is complete, FTSZ is going to recruit proteins that cut the cell in two. Now, actually, I realize this is about as far as I want to go today, sporulation. So probably I've been speaking too fast. And just remember, if you think I'm speaking too fast, go like this and, and let me know. Oh. Actually, I've missed something out here, haven't I? Before we do sporulation, we need to talk about inclusion bodies, which I must have like clicked over by mistake. Okay, inside the bacterial cell, you've got the nucleoid, not the nucleus, with the with the DNA. You've got oh, you, the other thing that you can sometimes see by light microscopy, and which can often be seen by electron microscopy, are inclusion bodies. Now, inclusion bodies are not really organelles in the same in the sense of, of, of what organelles do in a eukaryotic cell. They don't perform uh, metabolic functions. They're just for storage. 
of organic or inorganic nutrients. So organic nutrients could be glycogen, okay, polybeta hydroxybutyrate, or cyanophysin. So this is a polymer of arginine and aspartate. Okay, so you've either got granules that are going to store carbon or carbon and nitrogen. Now, inorganic nutrients that can be useful to keep a, uh, to keep a hold of are phosphate. Okay, phosphorus is very, absolutely essential for the synthesis of nucleic acids. Okay, and it can often be uh, a limiting nutrient for bacteria. So if you uh, have a lot of phosphorus around, it can be useful to uh, store it because in a couple of days, maybe you won't have any more. So this is just stored as a polyphosphate, as a kind of granule. Now, bacteria that can use sulfur or hydrogen sulfide as an electron acceptor, right, can often store sulfur. And that's what you can see here, okay? Purple sulfur bacteria. This one, these kind of things here, these are sulfur granules. Now, on electron microscopy, you can see granules in the inside of the cell. They can be either dense, or this one is like entirely empty. Poly, this, is, this is polyhydroxybutyrate because it's very hydrophobic during the preparation of the cell for the uh, electron microscopy. It's washed with an organic solvent. So all the polyhydroxybutyrate gets uh, dissolved here and is taken away. That's why it looks like totally empty. So this one, you can, you can tell what it is. Now, some of these granules are just directly in contact with the cytosol. Okay, so that's true for polyphosphate and some glycogen, glycogen granules. Okay, they're just stuck there in the middle of the cytosol. But mostly, uh, these granules are bounded or bound on the outside by a kind of shell structure made up of protein, or in some cases, lipid protein. So sulfur, these sulfur granules, they're not directly in contact with the cytosol. Don't know why, maybe they'd just be too reactive chemically. So they're uh, separated by a, a shell of a protein. That's true for this one as well, polyhydroxybutyrate. It's not sitting around in the, uh, uh, in the cytosol. It's got, a, it's got a shell around it. Okay, inclusion granules, they're just, store, just for storage. They're stocking up inorganic or organic nutrients. Okay, so you need to know what they are, what their function is, and one or two examples of granules. That's what you need to know. Right, so, so back to spores now. <coughs> now, some bacteria... Only gram positives can produce endospores. Okay, so an endospore, endospore is what? It's, well, it's, a, it's a spore, it's a kind of resistant, dormant form of the bacterial cell that is formed inside another vegetative cell. Okay, so it's inside, so it's an endospore. So as I say, okay, bacillus, clostridium, all these are gram positives only. Okay? And the location of the spore, of the endospore, can be an indication of the species. So if it's central, that's bacillus, subterminal or terminal is going to be clostridium. Uh, I, think, I think you'd have to be a very good microbiologist to be able to identify clostridium tetani versus another clostridial species just by looking at where the endospore is. Now, spores are, endospores are formed as a kind of highly resistant type of cell that can survive high temperature, desiccation, uh, chemical attack, freezing, of course, lyophilization. They're very, very resistant. And they're formed when, generally speaking, when, okay, in, in many cases, when bacteria have run out of food. So if you want to try and induce sporulation in bacterium, you put it in a very, very poor medium. 
and this can often induce sporulation. It's not the only inductor of sporulation. For example, um, uh, bacillus anthracis, the anthrax bacillus, it produces highly resistant spores that um, uh, lie dormant in the ground that are responsible for infections in farm animals, maybe decades after the last case, because they survive for such a long time. So normally the bacterium will uh, grow inside its host organism. Now once that host and, 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 uh, and it will be excreted in blood, infected feces, infected saliva. So once the bacterium is outside the body of the host, that's the kind of trigger for it to start to go into sporulation. Because it's not in the host anymore, it won't be able to grow. And the trigger is a high oxygen concentration for, for, for the, bac the, the bacterium detects. And this is what induces sporulation in this species. Uh, that's the reason why if animals are dying on a farm and you suspect anthrax as a cause, the autopsy cannot be done in the field. The body's got to be transported somewhere. Because if there's all this uh, infectious material which is uh, spread around near the carcass of the animal, then you're going to have a lot of spores that are going to be very resistant that will be formed. Okay, so sporulation induced by conditions that are not conducive for bacterial growth, okay? Mostly nutrients become scarce or it can be some other inducer. Okay, the, what do we need to understand about spores? Okay, what are they made of? What's their structure? Why are they so resistant? And how are they woken up? How are they formed and how are they, woke, how, and how are they reactivated? So we'll do structure first then say a little bit about reactivation, and then we'll look a bit more in more detail about their formation. So for structure, okay, what is the structure of an endospore? Well, we go from the outside to the inside. So you have an exosporium, which is just like a protein loosely attached. This is just a kind of outer coating. Doesn't really play a role in the resistance of the spore. Then you've got the spore coat. Actually, this diagram is not really very useful. You've got like two layers here, and you only need one, all right? Internal, external spore coat. There's no usefulness for that. Spore coat, it's made out of protein. They, are, they have a lot of disulfide bridges, so these proteins are very, very resistant to heat. They cannot be easily denatured. And... The main, one of the main functions of the spore coat is just to provide okay, heat resistance and a big, thick chemical barrier. So if you have something that's toxic for bacteria, like bleach, okay, or oxygen radical, something like this, it's, or, I don't know, some kind of antiseptic compound, it can't penetrate this protein coat. <coughs> then inside, you have the cortex, And that's mainly a big, thick layer of peptidoglycan with a large amount of dipicolinic acid or dipicolinate associated with calcium. So often it's thought that this dipicolinate is, uh, is involved in heat resistance for reasons a little bit obscure. But in fact, some mutant bacteria have been... Um, produced, have been uh, isolated, that can't form dipicolinic acid, but they, their endospores are still heat resistant. So it's probably not directly involved in heat resistance. Now on the inside of the cell, what have you got? Okay, now here you've finally got the plasma membrane of the cell here. And on the inside, you've got a kind of dehydrated cytosol. It's got ribosomes, condensed DNA, this time, not only with polyamines and the HU proteins, but it's condensed with these small acid-soluble proteins. Okay, acid-soluble means that they're basic, right? So they're basic proteins, they bind to DNA and condense it in a very, very inactive, inert form. Now, 
Now, of course, during the time that the endospore is lying around inactive, okay, some chemical insults can maybe manage to get through these protective layers and attack DNA. Oxygen radicals, they can attack DNA, they'll be harmful. Ultraviolet radiation, gamma radiation could come in and damage DNA. But there are large, there's a high concentration of DNA repair enzymes that are expressed and present in the spore cytosol here. So as soon as this cytoplasm becomes rehydrated, these DNA repair enzymes will become active and repair all the damage that's occurred. Okay, so that's a very important mechanism which allows spores to resist UV radiation and okay, some chemical uh, insults like oxygen radicals. Okay, so that's the basic structure of an endospore. And of course, so they're very resistant. They can remain infectious or, or, or viable for perhaps years. But of course, they have to be woken up at some point. They have to become, uh, they have to germinate just like a seed, right? And there are, well, okay, the main inducer of germination are what are called germinants. And these are things like amino acids. So once bacteria are in favorable conditions for growth, there's some kind of nutrients around, amino acids or maybe sugars, these germinants will induce germination. In many cases, germination is inefficient unless the spores have been activated first. So activation can be induced by heat. So if they're lying around like in freezing cold and there's some glucose around, it's not going to be enough to induce germination. You need to be in a warm environment, or at least, you know, the bacteria that have been studied that are mesophiles that like to grow in warm conditions, okay? So first, heat can induce activation, and this will render the spores more sensitive to chemical signals that induce germination. So germinants, like amino acids, what they're going to do is they're going to diffuse across the spore coat and interact with receptor proteins that are already present and start the germination process. One of the first things that happens is that picolinate here is going to be released from the cortex, diffuse out into the spore coat, and this will activate proteins that are going to degrade the spore coat. So maybe the main role of picolinate is not for heat resistance, but its role well, it is certainly involved in germination because it gives a chemical signal to activate proteins that are in the spore coat and break open the spore. Okay, and then that would allow water to diffuse inside and rehydrate the cytoplasm. And then afterwards, of course, it will allow this cell to grow and break out of the rigid structure. This has got to be broken down. Okay, so it kind of outlined that's how spore germination occurs. Right. And the last thing we need to cover today is spore formation. So big uh, experimental model for sporulation, okay, it's in gram-positive rods, bacillus, uh, clostridium, this kind of thing, so bacillus subtilis is the main experimental model for this. So all of this is kind of a, uh, a model which has been um, refined from observations in Bacillus subtilis. Okay, so you start out with a vegetatively reproducing cell. So normally, during cell division, each daughter cell is going to be identical. Okay, you have one cell, it splits down the middle, and each one can carry on growing. What happens during sporulation is that the first division is asymmetric. First division, no, the cell division is asymmetric. So instead of getting a cell wall formed that divides the growing cell in two, you get one cell, which is very, very small. This will become the endospore. And one cell, which is bigger. So this can be called the mother cell or the sporangium. 
and they are still within the same cell wall. Okay, so the membranes have been separated. These are two cells, but the peptidoglycan here encapsulates both of them. Okay, so they're not really separated. Okay, well, uh, yes and no. Okay, so they have a, they, 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 they have a separate a membrane that divides them, but not the rest of the cell wall. The next thing that happens is that the mother cell will engulf the smaller one. And then two things happen. Firstly, progressively, inside the endospore, the metabolism will shut down. There will only be a limited number of proteins expressed, these SASPs, DNA repair enzymes, you know, the things that are inside the endospore. Maybe the enzymes that are out in the... Uh, in, 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 well, okay. Things that, okay, remember, just remember that the things that are inside the endospore, SCSPs, DNA repair enzymes, they're expressed. The rest of the proteins that are normally expressed in a cell, they're not going to be produced. Okay. And then the mother cell does the rest of the work. Okay, so it's going to start by synthesizing the cortex, so that's peptidoglycan. And then once that's formed, then you'll have the spore coat, which is added. So during, okay, this step four and step five, then this is when you really have no metabolic activity inside the endospore anymore. So it's the mother cell that's performing all the synthesis. And then finally, final step is that the mother cell will die. It's going to kill itself and free up the endospore. So this is very interesting from the point of view of evolutionary biology because if you think about complex eukaryotes like us, okay, we have probably two or three hundred different cell types in our body. Okay? And it's possible because as during development, our, each cell doesn't stay identical to its mother cell. It differentiates into a different cell type very important for development. Another fundamental process in the development of multicellular organisms is programmed cell death. Cells that are too many or in the wrong place, they have to die when they're supposed to die. And if it doesn't happen, you get cancer. Okay, so these are very, very important for multicellular organisms. Now you can see during this process of sporulation, these two things are already occurring in a very simple way in bacteria. Okay? Firstly, at this point, you have differentiation. Instead of having two identical cells, you've got two very different developmental programs that are occurring in the mother cell and the endospore. Cell differentiation starts with bacteria. And secondly, right at the end, you've got programmed cell death. The mother cell commits suicide. So these fundamental processes that are essential for building multicellular organisms already exist, at least in a very simple form, in, in bacteria. Okay, we have 10 minutes, and I think I will leave you with another question. Okay. So I'll send this one out to you and see if you've really understood Sporulation and germination. Okay. So the code is 623421. Move this over and show you what we got. Okay. Okay, so these are the answers we've sent in. Well, you sent in, okay? Okay, nobody said A. That's right, they can resist 100 degrees. So that's not the right answer. Each heating cycle kills a certain proportion. That's what I seemed reasonable to me, okay? So maybe you don't have 100% efficacy. You have like 90% efficacy, so you have to do it three times to make sure they're all dead. But nobody thought that, okay? 
We've got two thirds of people, they think they survived the whole thing. And one third of people say, no, they're activated during the first cycle and then they get killed in the other cycles. So somebody who answered this, can you explain to us what is going on? One of these three people. Why did you answer that? Yeah? So after the first heating cycle, they drop back down and in the room temperature are activated and when they're no longer in the endospore, and so they're no longer resistant to high heat and then when they're heated again, they end up dying. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Did everybody get that? Maybe no. <laughs> Maybe not. Okay, when you start off, you have endospores. They're very resistant, but activation germination heat will activate them and they'll become more easily susceptible to germination so you heat these guys up they're in a nice tin of cassoulet right there's loads of amino acids in there so they can germinate so they stop being endospores they become vegetative cells bacilli so these are going to be actively growing but they won't be heat resistant so at the next cycle, they're all going to be killed. Okay? So that's why this is the correct answer. This is wrong in this case, in fact. So this used to be a uh, commonly used industrial process in, in, in food preservation. Not used so much now because it's considered safer, and it definitely is safer just to heat the whole thing up to 120 degrees and make sure everything gets killed in one go. Okay, so thank you very much. We see each other on Thursday, right? And I will send out another microbe of the week this evening at 7 p.m.